to do it again. We're going to have to do it again. Yes, slap, slap, slap. Slap. Off, off. It's a draw. 34. Go on. I'm Steve Sable of NFL Films, and I can say with certainty that the road to the Super Bowl covers 500 miles. That's how much film we shoot every season. And while this makes for a long journey, it also makes for an exciting one, filled with unexpected twists and turns and detours and, of course, shattering collisions. It's a rough ride, but this year marks the 10th year that we've produced Road to the Super Bowl, and every road has been unique. Now, 1989 will be remembered as the year that the Dallas Cowboys took the field without Tom Landry as their head coach, and the NFL conducted business without Pete Rozelle as its commissioner. 1989 will also be remembered as perhaps the greatest year in league history for closely contested games. Nearly half the games played were decided by seven points or less. One in every four games was decided by three points or less. Every weekend was a thriller. And there were a lot of thrilling performers who left a lasting impression on the road to the Super Bowl. The imposing figures that shaped pro football's landscape during 1989 included a running back who covered lots of territory. The Chiefs' Christian Okoye toppled tacklers and topped the NFL in rushing yardage. And off, it's Okoye, slashing his way back to tackle. Touchdown! 
trying to stop the 250-pound ball-carrying behemoth known as the Nigerian Nightmare was a terrifying task that induced cold sweat and extreme exhaustion. Are you okay? Yeah. A hundred percent? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Hand off a Koye. He's past the 10. He's past the 5. He chucks it. Touchdown. Unbelievable. Boy, he is too big and too fast to be playing running back in the NFL. Number 20 Barry Sanders was built much lower to the ground than a Koye. But the 5-foot, 8-inch Detroit rookie was also a towering talent. This compact model sparkled in every NFL showroom he appeared in, and his ability to shift gears in heavy traffic made him the NFC's leading rusher. Sanders and Okoye provided fans with good reason to watch the ground, but 1989 was also a season for keeping the eyes on the skies. It was the year of the receiver, and when pass catchers weren't blasting off in a blaze of glory, they were crashing to earth in a ball of fire. Explosive pass defenders were rarely outmuscled, but they were often outmaneuvered by elusive pass catchers. John's got to put it up. Big Ben right. No, he throws it across the middle. Carrier's got the short route to the 50. Carrier to the far side to the 40. Carrier to the 35 to the 30. Carrier down the sideline. Carrier's going to go. What a play! Touchdown! Is that incredible? Jack drops straight back. Looks. Looks. Throws to the sideline. It's caught by Ryzen. Ryzen is hit. Struggles, trying to get back, reverses, comes to the near side, breaks it back up the sideline, out of bounds, touchdown! He didn't go out of bounds, Ryzen scores! With fine receivers at his fingertips, Don Mikowski showed a magic touch, and the Green Bay Packers materialized into one of the NFL's most exciting teams. Their quick striking, quick thinking offense possessed an uncanny knack for transforming trauma into triumph. Here's Mikowski back to throw. On a blitz, comes over the middle, it is caught, and that is Jeff Query. He fumbles the ball, and the Packers serving sharp picks it up, and he's in the end zone. Behind magical Don Mikowski and marvelous Sterling Sharp, the pack made history by winning four one-point games. That is big time! Big time performances typified a campaign that saw 20 NFL pass catchers total over 1,000 yards receiving, more than in the previous two seasons combined. It was only fitting that the year of the receiver should mark the swan song for the remarkable Steve Largent, who became pro football's all-time leader in receiving touchdowns. Right back to pass, throw pump it, now let's throw to the end zone. There it is! It's touchdown Seahawks, number 100! While one pair of great hands enabled Steve Largent to set records, two pair of great hands helped the Los Angeles Rams reach the playoffs. Number 83, Willie Flipper Anderson, and Henry Ellard, number 80, formed a talented tandem that enabled the Rams to score more points than any team in the NFL except San Francisco.
stylish offense typified a region known for setting fashion trends. But this was a streaky team that won its first five games, then was stopped cold in their next four. Eventually, the Rams regained altitude. Flipper Anderson's NFL single-game record of 336 receiving yards helped L.A. beat the Saints. Six wins in their final seven contests thrust the Rams into the wild-card playoff round against the Eagles. While the defense frustrated Philadelphia, the offense followed head coach John Robinson's deceptively simple offensive game plan. Hey, hey, do something good this time. A pair of first period touchdowns paved the way for a 21 to seven victory. Give me some, Bobby, give me some, Bobby. Then the Rams' third straight East Coast trip took them to the Meadowlands, where they assumed a 7-6 halftime lead over the Giants. Everett back to throw on first down, sets and looks with time. Fires from the left corner, caught by Flipper Anderson, and in for the touchdown. You're an ass kicker, baby. You're an ass kicker. But regulation time ended with a score deadlocked at 13 apiece. Then, in sudden death, the Rams revived their sputtering offense and took wing to the final four. Back to throw and Brissett fires up the right side for Flipper Anderson. Caught for the touchdown and the Rams win it. Flipper Anderson beat the coverage up the sideline and caught it. A 30-yard strike as the Rams win it on head for the NFC Championship against the 49ers. For the 1989 Los Angeles Rams, the aerial route proved to be the smoothest and surest way to travel the road to the Super Bowl. Not everyone is cut out to be an NFL head coach. While a departed Tom Landry achieved larger-than-life status, others were lucky to maintain an even keel. Some coaches went down in 1989. But there were those who rose to the occasion. Lindy Infante led the Packers to their best record since 1972. And while Art Shell restored pride and poise to the Raiders, Marty Schottenheimer was revitalizing the Chiefs. Refuse to be blocked! Refuse to be blocked! Whether it's one guy, two guys, refuse to be blocked! And then you'll get it done! Now let's go! charging styles of Christian Okoye and the AFC's top-rated defense reflected Schottenheimer's no-nonsense approach. Rob, are they holding you? Don't let them hold you! Don't let them hold you! Where's your sense of humor? We got My sense of humor is during the week, not on Sunday. Every coach's sense of humor disappeared with the snap of the ball. While follies like this amused the fans, the coach whose job was on the line saw mistakes as no laughing matter. Cues drove coaches crazy, and throughout the years, no coach has been driven crazier than Chicago's volatile Mike Ditka. 
<laughs> See that? That's your IQ, buddy. Zero. Hold up. Turn over. So I'd rather talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you get I know, off. I know I'm smarter than that. <laughs> the dismal 1989 Bears at Ditka Fuming. And like many coaches, he fired his best broadsides in the press room, as well as on the playing field. We stink. We are absolutely a, an atrocious football team at this point right now. I don't know if we're capable of winning another football game. I don't think we are at this point. Well, the offense in the third quarter. The offense was terrible. Yeah, the offense wasn't there because the offense didn't have the ball in the third quarter. Why someone trying on first down? At what point of the game, dear? You don't know when it's good or bad. You really don't know because you don't know what we're trying to do. You guys don't look at the films. You don't know what happened. You really don't know. You think you know, but you don't know. And you never will. We can't be responsible for the blocking. We can't be responsible for the guys jumping offside. We can't be responsible for We get down there and, and, uh, and it was a dumb play by, by Anderson. I love, I love Anderson. But it was a dumb play when, he had, when his foot was, uh, shoe was coming off. Up the line screen, we were hiring take time out. We had a trap play called. And, 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 and shoe comes off. Be realistic. If you had a bounty, uh, why in the hell would you put it on a kicker? It's been the six-week slump. And you hope he don't get hurt. You want to be sure he kicks. I mean, hell, don't touch him. Be careful. Oh, oh I would have said something to Buddy, but he wouldn't stand on the field long enough. He put his big fat rear end into the dressing room. I resent that. I've been on a diet. I lost a couple of pounds, and I thought I was looking good. And then he, and he goes and... Uh, called me fat. I kind of resent that a little bit. Now, first of all, you're going to ask me what I thought of the call last week on Frank Warren? God. <laughs> Along with reporters and rivals, referees brought out the caustic nature of a head coach. I tell that official he's very helpful. He's standing there like a statue. He's a first-year official. You know what? Was he from college? I hate them college guys. That's all right. I hate them. Was he a bull, a bull official? Uh -huh. Is he a college well, official? Well, he's a, he's a first year man. He's just starting Would you ever bring him over to me, please? Well, well, Let me talk okay. to the college guy. Well, I hate college guys. Okay. This isn't college. You're not at a home college. I, I, I understand. This is NFL, which stands for not for long when you make them yeah. calls. Yeah. I'll be selling Go. groceries. No, no! How, no! You're talking about us! No way! No, hey, this damn foot there! No way! Play. We'd like a replay. Can we get the replay, please? Where's the replay? Who's in charge of the replay? Stop the clocks. Do something and get the replay. Can we get a replay on it? What about a replay? Here it is right here. Oh, it's a touchdown, Jimmy. It's a touchdown. It's a get back. After further review, the play stands as called. Double sink, one take. Lucky. You're lucky. It's the first time you've been right in five years. Hey, Roy, that's two calls you give him down there now. If both of his knees are down, we can see the TV, too. They looked at it close, evidently. Uh, the pass interference was hard, and this one was hard. The, the fleeting thrill that you get from accomplishment, in most cases, offsets all of the trouble that you go through to accomplish. Bill Parcells accomplished wonders with a team that lost key players to injury and retirement. With a combination of old pros and young Turks, the Giants won the NFC Eastern Division Championship. Parcells instilled desire and discipline in a rebuilding team that required a firm hand. Hey, Ricky! Come here, I want to tell you something. Come here. Now listen to me, Ricky. I don't care. I tell you, you get in a fight and you get trying to escape, you're going home for good, okay? Just so you know. The success of the New York Giants demonstrates why men like Bill Parcells persevere at a job where winning can't be achieved without sacrifice. Okay, fellas? Hey, fellas, this is what you work on season for. This is why you lift all them weights. This is why you do all that. Settle down. We gotta come back and win the game now. And this is where you win the game. Right here. If we can get a first down, the game's over. Oh boy. This 
is this big. Hurry it up, hurry it up, hurry it up, hurry. You better hurry. If you're ever going to get a blitz, this is it right here. If you're ever going to get one, this is it. Come on after us, come on after us, you son of a Blitz out. Blitz out. Ah, they're not going to do it. Reverse! Oh, great, we got it. For every coach who traveled the road to the Super Bowl in 1989, there were moments that made this difficult journey worthwhile. You want that big play stuff, don't you? I want it. Throughout 1989, it seemed that nearly every team in the NFL suffered a slump, a cold spell, then rebounded with a hot streak. Now, this made for an intense and highly competitive race to New Orleans. In fact, going into the final weekend of the regular season, a record 17 teams were still alive for the playoffs. It was a, a crazy season of ups and downs, and the downs weren't necessarily deadly, and the ups didn't always guarantee ultimate victory. This year belonged in a padded cell. It was filled with things that, uh, that just didn't make sense. And nowhere was the bizarre nature of this year more evident than in the AFC Central. Ladies and gentlemen, we proudly present the AFC Central Division Symphony, conducted by Maestro Charles Noel. AFC Central had reason to be pleased with their performance in 1989. AFC! 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 What of the division had a quartet of quarterbacks named Bubby, Boomer, Bernie, and Moon? It sounded like a law firm. Bernie Kosar of the Cleveland Browns was an expert at cross-examining a defense. Boomer Esiason of the Cincinnati Bengals specialized in the really big trials. Warren Moon of the Houston Oilers defended the inmates in the House of Pain. And junior partner Bobby Brister handled the small claims of the Pittsburgh Steelers. For several seasons, rivalry in the AFC Central had been growing more intense, involving every coach and each city. Will the next person that sees anybody throw anything onto this field, point them out, and get them out of here. You don't live in Cleveland, you live in Cincinnati. That guy over there, he, not he doesn't have a friend in the world. <laughs> we don't and after that. watching you people, I don't think I do either. <laughs> the head coaches were a diverse group as well. Fun-loving Jerry Glanville in Houston. And Cincinnati suddenly serious Sam Weish. Cleveland's nearly anonymous Bud Carson, who at 58 was a rookie head coach in the NFL, and Pittsburgh's legendary Chuck Knoll, winner of four Super Bowls, but not an easy man to know. And I think the respect is there, but it's not a friendship. It's not a, uh, a thing where everybody enjoys each other's company. You gotta fight. Scrap, you gotta defend yourself. People wonder why you play like this over here because the other team will kill you. They'll hit you in the mouth. If you don't hit them back, they're gonna hit you twice next play. Even Cincinnati's joined in. Where they used to be finesse and skill, and now they're even fighting back. And the three most penalized teams are right here. All in the AFC Central. We have the legal formation, the offense is not set. We have two men on the defense. We have a personal foul roughing the quarterback defense. And we have a personal foul number 78. Late hit, Cincinnati. You guys have 30 minutes. 
to make them pay for everything that happened in that first half, to regain three points that were ripped off from you in the first half, and to kick their ass. If you're a man, you'll do it because you got a better team. The Bengals were defending champions of the AFC Central, and now even the conservative Cleveland Browns were emulating their wide-open style. Here's a pitch out the Metcalf, and he wants to throw. Deeper Lang, orders wide open, touchdown Browns! It's science fiction. Time. Science fiction was a good way to describe Cleveland's dog pound. Houston's house of pain. Cincinnati's jungle. And Pittsburgh's slightly tarnished steel curtain. Chuck Knoll had not been to the playoffs in four years. The team had 12 rookies, and the Steel Curtain defense was coached by a man named Rod Lust. Needless to say, Pittsburgh lost the first two games of the season by the combined score of 92 to 10. If it weren't so sad, it would have been funny. Number 33 Merrill Hodge and Bubby Brister were willing to try anything. But the offense remained dead last in the NFL for the entire season. Bubby wasn't bragging, but his team hung tough beating Miami in the rain and barely losing to Houston in the snow. The victory left Jerry Glanville one game shy of clinching the division title. But Cincinnati was waiting. We could blow this game wide open. We have beat him by three touchdowns. You got his ass, Eddie Brown! Fires down in the end zone. Intended yes. first round touchdown! The boy for him feels good to be one in 31 nothing. Let me tell you. And the Bengals pouring it on. Now lead the orders 44 to nothing. They were cocky and doing all their talking and their coach doing all of his talking and all, and they got humiliated. We're going right for their jugular, and we weren't going to reset our heel either. <laughs> really, I mean, you, you can only be so stupid, but they have exceeded the limits here somehow. <laughs> you know, they're, really, they're a team with no discipline. I knew Sam a long, long time. Uh, I don't think any less of Sam now than I ever did. The following week, Bud Carson and the Browns beat Houston, earning Cleveland the division title and placing every AFC Central team in the playoffs except one. Incredibly, Cincinnati, 5-1 and one in the division, was out. And Pittsburgh, 1-5, and five, was in. The wildcard game looked to be a mismatch. The Steelers against a Houston team that had already beaten them twice. But Pittsburgh had learned some valuable lessons during the long uphill climb. Charles Knoll had orchestrated another masterpiece. A 26 to 23 overtime upset over a formerly brash team that in three weeks lost to all three of their central division rivals. It cost a good man his job. It's well documented what he's done for the city of Houston with the, the, uh, the ill and the uh, homeless. I wish both of them the best of luck. Glanville left the division on his way to coach the Atlanta Falcons as Cleveland carried the colors of the AFC Central into a battle against the Buffalo Bills. Their peers would have been proud of the head knocking. Cleveland hung on for a 
34-30 victory and the road to the Super Bowl had just one more stop. One more! During the 1980s, the Denver Broncos and the San Francisco 49ers have won the most championships in their respective conferences. In 1989, Denver improved its running game and its defense and posted the best record in the AFC. And as for the 49ers, well, you start with Joe Montana. He's certainly the player of the decade and maybe the greatest quarterback of all time. And he's got those two all-pro receivers, Jerry Rice and John Taylor. Giving those guys to Montana is like arming Superman with a set of brass knuckles. In an age of parity, the 49ers proved it's still possible to put together a dominant team. On the road to Super Bowl 24, Joe Montana never took a false step and scaled the heights of greatness. He completed 70% of his throws for 26 touchdowns, and his passing efficiency rating was the best in NFL history. But statistics cannot convey Montana's uncanny skill. His motion is classical. His delivery, deft. His feet, nimble. His vision, sweeping. Perhaps his greatest gift is the way he recovers from apparently hopeless situations. Against Philadelphia, San Francisco trailed by 11 points in the fourth quarter. But in the final 12 minutes, Montana threw scoring passes to four different receivers and rallied the 49ers to a 38-28 victory. Our lights were never totally turned out, and uh, as long as they're not totally out, you know, and, and they aren't with this ball club, I think we've shown that a number of times, and uh, Joe just you know, it's just vintage. I mean, he just keeps getting better and better. And, and obviously, we're very, very fortunate to have a quarterback with his skills and his determination and his leadership ability. Under George Seifert's leadership, the defending Super Bowl champions never lost their hunger and remained feisty competitors, playing with an intensity that made Seifert the winningest rookie head coach in NFL history. While the 49ers' defense played tough and tight, the offense expanded, averaging even more points per game than last year. Jerry Rice again led the team and the league in yards gained receiving. Rice and emerging star John Taylor, number 82, combined for 27 touchdowns, averaged more than 30 yards per scoring catch, and their outside speed put San Francisco on the inside track to success. In the NFC West, it was all one-way traffic on the road to the Super Bowl as the 49ers won the division title and made the playoffs for the eighth time in the decade. He's the midfield, he's to the 40, he's got a blocker in front of him! He's to the 10, he's to the 5, it's a touchdown! John Taylor, another spectacular touchdown! Chance of a lifetime, let's go! Ready? Yeah. Today, for the third straight season, the Vikings battle the 49ers here at Candlestick Park in the NFC Divisional Playoffs. The 49ers in the league's top offense against the Vikings in the number one defense. The survivor reaches the NFL's Final Four. The 49ers crushed the Vikings 41 to 13, and the team of the 80s continued their march toward the first Super Bowl of the 90s. In 1989, the Denver Broncos were no longer a kindler, gentler team. Bring it today. Bring it today, the Broncos' defense grew bigger and 
Molina. There was also more muscle on offense. Head coach Dan Reeves weeded out the weaklings and sculpted an undersized offensive line into overpowering blockers. While bigger meant better, the Broncos' biggest star had his leanest year. John Elway, more often jeered than cheered, did not have a super season. But rookie running back Bobby Humphrey did. And he gave the Broncos a set of legs as powerful as Elway's arm. While Humphrey rushed for a thousand yards and lifted the Bronco offense to another level, Nothing in the mile-high air moved faster than an Elway pass. Although Elway's statistics were poor, he has never led a team so rich in talent or better balanced. Still, the scales of victory were often tipped by one pull of his right arm. Elway is back, pops up in the pocket, throwing it to the end zone for Vance Johnson. The Broncos were no longer a one-man show when the defense took center stage. Yeah. Real bullets, five. Real bullets. Hey. Watch the screen. Watch the screen. OT! OT! Once the weak sisters of this team, they're coming, they're coming strong, baby! The Bronco defense became the Big Brothers and led the charge to the playoffs. They allowed the fewest points in the NFL. And every starter on defense had at least one sack or interception as Denver led the conference in takeaways. The Broncos ran away from their competitors and clinched the Western crown four weeks before the season ended, leaving no doubt about who was the best team in the AFC. In the AFC playoffs, the Broncos had to launch a furious rally to overcome the Cinderella Pittsburgh Steelers. L.A. to throw on first down, pumps it, and throws it long, and it's wide open for a touchdown! A step away from the title, the Bronco defense stepped forward. Listen out! Listen out! Come in here! Get your ass in here! Get in here! Get in here! Nickel five, ready? Come off that rock! Come on! Get in there! Calls for the ball. Sam is a little low. The ball is loose. Picked up by Hodge and a big pileup. The Broncos recover the fumble. Victory brought the Denver Broncos to the championship game for the third time in four years. I had a game ball on my lap, and we're set to the plane and begin to set. Say again. Clear the field of all threats and photographers immediately. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Bob Starr along with Jack Youngblood. We're at Candlestick Park in San Francisco. It is the NFC Championship game. We're going to set our own standards today. We're not going to play at that level. We're going to establish a level of play that is great, and we're going to maintain it throughout this whole game. Let's go, y'all. Let's go. the all-out run. 
rush, and Elway's pass is complete across the 50-yard line, throws over the 40, and breaks the tackle, and Missouri trying to cut back left to the 25. Elway rolling up, shoveling to Humphrey, who drops the football, and the Browns have it at the 8-yard line. Second and 10, Bozar drops, throw up the middle, and this one is intercepted. Poorly thrown football by Bernie Kosar that floated over the middle. The NFC Championship game is underway. Montana flip, then passes, and it's complete to Jones. And he fumbles the ball. It is picked up by McIntyre. He fumbles the ball. This time the Rams get it. Come on, man. We need to set him right now. Yeah. Right the hell now. <laughs> Everett puts it on his hip. Throws for the long one. He's got a receiver. Anderson and Ronnie Lott up there just in the nick of time. What a play by Lott. Kosar, play action throw coming up. Deep over the middle. Play hold up from two. It's the play ball at the eight-yard line. Binder and Sewell flying Elway. Pick up some of the blitz. John flushed out to the right. Throws it upfield for a wide open. Mike Young at the 30, at the 20, at the 15. to the left against Durbin. Montana steps back, throws for the end zone! Kosar looking over the middle. Pick it up! Pick it up! Throwing deep. Left side for Bryant. Bryant cuts down Brown! And the Browns are back in the game! No one wants to throw it on first and goal. Mobley touchdown! Sammy starts left. Hands blocked. Dying toward the end zone. Serves! The Broncos now have their biggest lead of the game. Super Bowl. There are many winners, but only two champions. Now they meet for a prize only one can win. 